Sputnik. All right, welcome to ConCon episode three. I'm DR. I'm Ben. And um, we are coming to you live ish, not live, I guess, recorded, but from uh, Taramina, uh, Sicily, uh, for this day one of the Science of Consciousness conference. It took a lot to get here. We had to avoid a <laughs> Mount Etna volcanic eruption. Yeah, neither of our flights into Catania succeeded. So I took a flight and drove all the way across the island and Ben took a boat from Malta. So uh, we survived. We made it. Um, all right. So we wanted to, we're going to do these, uh, the next several episodes are just going to be short uh, recaps of what we kind of heard from the first day, from, from each day of the conference and kind of, you know, not necessarily talk exclusively, I think, about the conference, but like the ideas that came up and kind of our thoughts about them and um, all the questions and comments we didn't get to make during the sessions. <laughs> yeah, I noticed you had like the itchy hand syndrome towards yeah, the, yeah, towards yeah. the end of that first workshop. Yeah, I, I I seem to get no no love from any of the uh, <laughs> any of the people. For we'll see if I can get a comment in at some point. Um, okay, so we went to two different sessions today. It was a workshop day. Uh, the first one was about uh, I think it was called ethical concerns of AI and consciousness. Yeah, and yeah. I think it was way less about consciousness and more about AI in some ways, but. Yeah, I, I feel like in some of the talks, it was almost like an afterthought. Of like, oh, wait, this is a consciousness conference. Yeah. Like, and then they, they would just throw it in there sort of at the end. Consciousness, question mark, question mark. Yeah, <laughs> literally, right? There are a couple of <laughs> slides like that. Um, all right. Well, what did you like? What were some of your uh, takeaways take for the first first bit? Yeah, well, n number one, I guess I'm not I'm used to going to conferences. I'm a research scientist. I'm not used to going to conferences where there's such a multidisciplinary uh, yeah. vibe, right? Where there's like quantum physicists and there's, you know, like chemists and biologists and philosophers. And I, it's kind of nice to get out of my um, AI research bubble and to see that people outside of that bubble are extremely antagonistic <laughs> to AI. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, to, to me names. make very wild uh, very um, certain claims that you know oh, yeah, artificial intelligence is really artificial stupidity and um, <laughs> stochastic parrots and you know all, all that sort of uh, good stuff I think yeah I mean my, <laughs> there's several takeaways that that was probably the biggest one like that I would take back to sort of my crew uh, at work I'd say wow it turns out like a lot of people are you know pretty antagonistic towards these <laughs> ideas. I have some theories why that's the case. One of them, I think, is a lot of those people are coming from cognitive science, and I think they maybe feel threatened. Like, their entire sort of um, metho methodology for doing research is somewhat threatened by yeah. the arrival of GPT-4, and so you have to, like, dig your heel in the sand or move the, yeah. the, go the goalposts or, you know, flip to the dark side. And it seems like most of them are just moving goalposts and, uh, you know, digging their heels in. Yeah, this, I would say this woman, um, Robin Zabrowski from Beloit College. I forget what she said her specialty. So it was like... Um, Great talk, by the way. Yeah, She's yeah. She's awesome. Uh, but she, she had a lot of spicy takes that surprisingly didn't seem to be received as spicy by the audience. And maybe there were like the few yeah. people sprinkled in. Uh, she, she mentioned she taught AI for 15 years. She had a class that's like um, AI in popular fi in fiction and reality or something like that. Yeah, she, she spent a long time trashing uh, Isaac Asimov. Yeah. <laughs> Just fair. <laughs> and his like three principles for robotics, which I think was actually a good point that like even in the story, these fail. So like why would we think that these are actually right. good principles? <laughs> Um, for how to how to create um, stuff, but I thought that she. One of the things I thought was interesting is this one guy that we kept noting, and he was in another session with us later that kept asking like really great questions. And with the GPT four stuff, it just felt like these kind of like, hey, so you're trying to tell us that you know, uh, AIs. So one of her big contentions was that large language models have like no path toward consciousness, and these aren't definitely aren't conscious. You know, we've had our takes about that as well, but I think it's kind of like a, I don't know, bold claim to be this early in the AI thing and say that. And he was kind of like, hey, so, um, you know, they're doing pretty amazing stuff. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I feel like she, she like her her opinions. If you just crowd like this corner of Twitter that's like spearheaded <laughs> by I don't know Jan Lacoon, who I think famously said that GPT was an off ramp towards the path to general intelligence. Like he he's very anti. Mm. There's the stochastic parrot paper, and th- those people say there's no meaning behind this. It's, if it can't be there can't be any meaning if it's just statistics. You know, at the end of the day, next token prediction, and. Uh, I, I guess I thought that was so, more of like a tiny sliver of like part of Twitter, you know? Yeah. And it seemed like there was like a sort of a um, contingent of people who were like totally on board with those ideas, uh, w- which was a bit surprising. She was really into uh, like embodiment. Yeah. Um, and so the, and, and that was, I don't know, I think that's going to be an ongoing thing at the conference of like, can conscious be unembodied? Can you have digital consciousness or does it have to connect to the body and emotions? And, you know, I think that she, she said that, you know, human consciousness is a, more of an emotional experience than an intellectual experience, which I agree with, but I don't think that necessarily consciousness has to be purely emotional or at least emotional in the ways that humans are. Yeah, I, I think... Is it a lack of imagination? You know, like, is, are these people who are claiming that you have to have embodiment? I mean, she even, she didn't go so far as to say that to have emotions you have to have embodiment, but she basically said it's the only thing that we've seen so far, so I can't imagine it not being the case. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about to the, the first couple talks, which were two guys that are doing some collaborating. A philosopher, John Sullins from Sonoma State University, and um, uh, this guy from Palermo just down the road, a- Antonio Cella, and they're doing these studies where they are, they have a robot that is um, acting as an assistant to someone who is setting a table for someone with dementia. And apparently this is a real scenario for um, one of the research Solons, I think. And um, the, the study is basically the robot either prompts them on things that they should do, or speaks out loud its ex- exact thoughts, which is like, oh, he's putting a knife on the table. Knives are dangerous. I should say something. And then it will say something. It's kind of like the way they had it set up was a little bit awkward, where it's like the robot's saying something in a very different voice that's like its um, thought voice, and then it says it out loud. But it actually like created a lot of positive emotions for people that were interacting with the robots, and they trusted it more because it felt very transparent. Um, and I thought that was actually a pretty cool concept and it like as a way of like ai being more engaging and then that turned into debates about like you know our llms don't really have that kind of transparency there this robot thing is not an ai from what i could tell right it was just like a had a bunch of program states that it would engage in i, I mean i think it was an example of good old-fashioned ai it had like a knowledge base and then it would try to sort of like uh, pick up keywords from what people were yeah. saying and then ping this knowledge base and say like oh you said knife I know knives are unsafe from my knowledge base and then spit out some text-to-speech sort of thing. <laughs> this is just making me think. I think some people um, engage in the world in, in this way. You know, you, like you'll <laughs> talk to people. Like you, you can prompt them to say certain things just by like giving them their hot keywords, you know? That's true. I think, yeah, so it, it, the, way, the takeaway that I got was, and to me, this is sort of in the field of um, human-robot interaction, HRI, right? So it's like, is it better if the robot just sits there and thinks and then does an action? Like you're like, hey, can you hand me the, the spoon? And it just sits there like quietly and you're like, is it doing anything? And then it, and then it hands you the spoon. Or if it's thinking out loud like, oh, I know what a spoon is and I think I saw a spoon on the table so I'm going to reach for it. And then, I mean, I think someone in the audience asked that I said, well, is it the fact that it's like narrating its own thoughts? Is that the thing that people like? Or is it just interacting with you more? Like a a general richness of interaction and how do you even disentangle the two? I think this also goes to like, you know, explainable AI, right? Like in some ways, people like explainable AI. Doctors want not just uh, an AI that spits out, oh, this tumor is cancerous. They want like a decision tree of like, oh, is this many like millimeters and blah, blah, blah. And that's why I think that. So I kind of feel like explainability is always good in terms of like their connection to... Uh, it thinking about its own thought process as a, what do they call it? Like self, self, uh, self reflection, self thought, self reflection or vocalized thought or whatever. Yeah. 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 There's like a technical term there. Internal using. voice. Inner, yeah. Inner voice. Inner voice. Yeah. Inner voice. Yeah. That I'm not so sure 
is any different than just sort of an explainable AI. Yeah. And someone also asked this. They said, well, what if instead of this inner voice, because they had two different voices for it thinking yeah. on its own out loud to you and then it talking to you, like, what if you just had it speak what it's thinking? Like, yeah. Would that change anything? And they're like, yeah, we're working on that experiment. So, Yeah, I think the, you know, when I think about really positive interactions of humans that feel trustworthy to me are people whose motives and engagement seem very transparent. And as a human, often that is like, their their manner their emotions their face that i can see that they're kind of like engaging with me and robots have none of that at their disposal so if they're just like actually vocalizing some of the things that they can't communicate very well otherwise maybe that actually goes a long way into sort of like yeah except it doesn't go a long way because the this system was so simple it's just a knowledge base and it would you know query and there would be hits i think that you you can't scale that up so what i mean by that is it can tell you exactly what it's doing because the algorithm's super simple. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, I see. I, I know that knives are dangerous because of my knowledge base. But if it's a large language model, which, you know, they sort of like um, basically said that the next generation will have a lang large language model in it. Yeah. Like then you, you can't really get a system where the inner thoughts aren't abstracted stories. Like there's no there's no way for that simplistic robot to lie to you about what it's thinking because yeah. it's it's literally just narrating its exact chain of uh, yeah, yeah. abilities. But a large language model, it's um, you know so opaque that it's giving you a story, and then like how do you trust that story, right? Yeah. Well, and I thought that the they somebody gave an example of this. Um, the guy who asked all the questions we liked. I think he asked. He talked about the. Um, uh, this prison sentencing, sentencing recommendations engine that the state of Wisconsin was using or whatever and went to the Supreme Court and they like wanted to know what were the metrics in that algorithm and they're like, no, it's protected, you can't see what's in there, right? And I was just imagining to myself if like this was an LLM and like you saw, it was like, oh, here's all the things that I was factoring in and it was like, oh, it's like socioeconomic background and race or whatever, all these like hot button issues and you're like, whoa, no, you can't use that, right? And it's like, well, no, I, I'm doing, you know, like I'm working at this different layer of abstraction. And so it's like, as a human, though, that's what you want. I want to be able to interrogate someone's motives. And they're like, mm, I'm not sure about this raise because of this and this and this. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you, you're, you know, you don't want to give me the raise because you saw this negative performance, but I actually did. That's not true. And let me let me like change your um, thoughts about it. But human stories are fallible, you, even if they're, they don't think they're lying. Right. People often don't even understand their oh. own motivations. Yeah. Um, which gets into, like, back to the Robin speaker who was using, like, examples from science fiction to sort of elucidate, like, AI, AI ethics. And she was mentioning this author I didn't know, oh, Stanislav Lem. Oh, Stanislav, Stanislav Lu. Lu? L-E-W, I think. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Like yeah, I want to read some. I think I'm gonna read some of his stories. Yeah. yeah, more sort of absurd. Like people create robots that are like emotional or like have like a sort of like faults in ways yeah. that we do. And so then you realize that in this process of creating robots, we might not be creating Spocks, right? We might be creating like mirrors of ourselves with yeah. all of the foibles that we have. Well, and it kind of seemed like that's what we we talked about this a little bit after, but it kind of seemed like there's two two things happening. On one, there's this like extreme pessimism around the validity of uh gpt and like there was someone was like oh they it's passing the bar and she's like oh not all the cal and all the times there's this qualified case and it's like okay but still pretty impressive and on the other hand she's saying well, we we need ai that's more like humans which is like more emotional more connected which is kind of i don't know it's it's sort of like do you do you want are you advocating for more AI or less ai and i think mostly what she was trying to say is that the kind of uh, the kind of intelligence that AI is generating won't be uh, won't be general intelligence because it won't be like human intelligence because it doesn't have emotions. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a big leap. I think it's I mean, a big leap. Yeah. Before we even broach the emotion subject, like it makes me think. You know, someone brought up the fact that a calculator in a single dimension is super intelligent, like a yeah. long multiplication, right? And I kind of feel like good old-fashioned AI, let's say like decision trees, right, are closer to the calculator. Um, or let, let's say the calculator is to good old-fashioned AI as like human intelligence is to like kind of GPT-like intelligence, or maybe I got that reversed. But my, my point is that 
GPT makes mistakes and is stubborn and <laughs> gaslights you in ways yeah. that humans do exactly. in a way that a calculator I mean, would never do or a decision which tree would never do. All of its inputs come from human language, right? right. It's not like, you know, the the somebody made the point of like, oh, I could be raised on an, on an island and I would still be ethical or moral or whatever, which I have questions about that anyway. But yeah, like, I didn't understand that. But the... Um, uh, I forgot where I was going with this. Well, I don't know. Let's, yeah, well, basically, I think G, GPT's type of intelligence is the fun, fuzzy, sort of um, fault-ridden kind of intelligence yeah, that humans yeah, yeah, have yeah. versus something like a decision tree or you know, support vector machine, some classical thing. Yeah. Much like a calculator is never going to gaslight you. Yeah. Right? It's just, it looks like one vector of, in, of intelligence that, that is similar to the way humans operate. And I kept thinking about... Um, uh, this quote from, or this idea from Yuval Harari from the Homo, the Sap, no, what was the second book called? Homo Deus. And he talks about how like, you know, don't be worried about AI because artificial intelligence doesn't need to correlate with artificial consciousness. And we'll have these like super intelligences, but they will be on very specific vectors. They're amazing at, you know, facial recognition or next, or, you know, uh, next word prediction, but they're not necessarily, you know, amazing at all the things in all the same ways that humans are and to me that seems like a great model it's like we're, we're kind of like extending out our super our conscious superpowers in all these different vectors but those vectors don't necessarily have to talk to each other yeah that reminds me of the first speaker one of his big points is that we can probably harness ai as a tool to make ourselves more moral right yes we have all these cognitive biases it would be great, really great if we had a robot sort of in our corner being like hey you know what that's that's the sunk cost fallacy you know and like just nudges us in a more moral direction or something yeah yeah and actually uh, that was I, I wanted to i wanted to bring that up the what was the term they kept using um pro pronesis phronesis <laughs> definitely uh <yes. laughs> cognitive science it was a new term. yeah it was a new term so basically phronesis, yeah. the phronesis it was like a, an old philosophical term which is sort of practical wisdom that you use to navigate ethical problems. Um, I remember you told me at some point that um, one of AI's worst uh, treat, like for self-driving is that it's bad at getting novel situations right the first time, right? And this kind of sounded to me like the moral version of that, like someone's having a difficult situation and they need some advice and you're gonna give them good advice even though you've never dealt with that situation in the, in the first place. And they were kind of talking about how you know, the, um, an AI might be able to kind of provide you practical advice and talk you through things in a rational way that would allow, enable you to make better decisions. Yeah, they called it AP, artificial uh, phrenesis. Yeah. Which to me sounds a bit like virtue ethics, like that concept of like you, you do all these sort of things that you, you acculturate yourself and you live life in the correct way. And then when an ethical quandary happens, you just know the right thing to do. By the way, they brought up the fact that in trolley problems, <laughs> people seem to give a pass to AIs that like lean utilitarian, but yeah. not humans. They say, yeah. oh, what, what a monster. Yeah. Like, you know. Or they, and they, they can get humans to perform better in a utilitarian way if you like act like a robot. Pretend that you're a robot and, and, and behave that way, yeah. I, I wanted to actually, actually ask about that or maybe just ask you. I feel like people give robots a pass for being kind of like uh, cold-hearted and you know, calculated because we don't apply theory of mind to them because they're not moral machines yet, right? I, well, also I think it is a... Um, years ago I'd read this article about, um, or maybe it was a podcast or something, about the army. This is like not even AI, but they built this like chatbot thing that like seemed like a, a human, like sergeant somebody or whatever, and you could chat, you could ask it questions through the website. And they found it would, people would ask all these really interesting kinds of questions that they would never ask a human because there are recruiters that were doing, you know, and they, and they were tracking this thing and doing all this data. And it um, was this way of certain, for certain types of people to engage in certain types of ways that they wouldn't ever do normally, right? So like you have like the, with any human engagement, we're talking about the emotion piece you're always engaging with that person's emotions as well as their intellect. It's like, oh, I just need some information from you, but now I have to ask you this embarrassing question or I'm not sure, I, I'm afraid I'm gonna look dumb or I'm gonna afraid I'm gonna make some commitment. So when you have that actually impartial entity there, but who is also intelligent can answer your questions, that seems pretty powerful. I kind of yeah, got one, I kind of like got a, one over really by good, these guys. 
point, it, I'm always struck by how patient ChatGPT is with me. <laughs> I was expected to just like, you know, start like hurling insults yeah. and be like, really? Like you don't get it yet, you know? But yeah. that's the, that is the nice thing about these things. Like you could have a sort of a moral agent AI in your corner. You could ask it really sticky, thorny questions that maybe you wouldn't want to ask someone you know because you'd be afraid about the social implication or something. But I, I w also was won over by this guy. I think he was... Um, yeah. I think, all, in fact, that whole workshop, I, I think, was great. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Surprised by the anti-AI sentiment. <laughs> um, but, yeah. But loved uh, the workshop. Um, all right. Should we talk uh, briefly about the second half? <laughs> so this is divided into... You, so if you looked at my notebook or listened to this podcast, you would think it was, you know, we've had 15 minutes of the second thing and four hours of the other thing, but it's actually 50, 50. Um, and the second half was just, I, I sort of went knowing it, it was not going to be my cup of tea. Cause it's like, okay, let me dip my toes back in. And I use this term. We've probably said it on the podcast before. I think of like the quantum microtubules and people are really into quantum consciousness stuff. And I frankly don't get it, and I still don't get it. After I have a theory. Today. I have a theory. So, I mean, Sir Roger Penrose, he has a, he has a Nobel <laughs> Prize, right? And so everybody is, whatever he says, there's going to be a faction of people. Who and it seems like literally double or more from last year, by the way. Mm. It's not, I like, there were talks about it, but now, like, it's so many. Yeah, so we went, we caught the very end of the, there's a session with Penrose, and then we... The next session was quantum biology. Quantum biology. Which basically means looking for... And they trolled us because there was a thing in there about psychedelics that they never talked about psychedelics at all. Maybe the last guy was going to. I don't oh, know. But we, yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> we bounced, yeah. yeah. But quantum biology is finding quantum effects in biology. It's pretty innocent. Yeah. It's not like uh, woo-woo spooky quantum equals Yeah, but it's also like what does this have to do with... Um, consciousness and actually all of the guys that we that we, we shouldn't actually mention them because it's like all of the people that spoke in this one were kind of like yeah this isn't consciousness um one of the guys let's see this is number six yeah so it was um travis craddock is i think the guy that we didn't see uh jim al khalili yeah. Yeah. is that his name uh who's i think is pretty famous he's written a bunch of books and then Giuseppe Vitellio, and then Joe John McFadden was the first guy. And so Joe John was pretty good at University of Surrey. Oh, I guess they both were University of Surrey yep. guys that we like. Yep. And and Jim, they, wait, it's Joe John and Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, but both of them had different angles that were basically saying like, they explained quantum biology, which was new to me. I had not really understood that before. And it's kind of like, oh, you have moments, like very small molecular moments in cells and things where um, uh, you see quantum effects, meaning that there's sort of like entanglement, I guess. I don't know, Ben, maybe you can explain a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, I think that these guys were basically putting limits on like what, you know, quantum effects could entail in terms of like, affecting anything that the brain does yeah. and they relegated it down to things like smell maybe and uh like ion channels yeah. maybe things that happen in very very short time scales and then are very very small because uh, otherwise basically when you get any large uh, sort of amount of particles at all everything like decoheres and so the the quantum effect which I've, i feel like people just don't quite get it there are a lot of like weird questions in the audience like i i didn't understand what anyone was saying but then i understood that the questions were kind of bullshit yeah like and yeah. cuz they're they're basically like, like well okay if there is a quantum effect in the ion channel that means the whole brain's quantum yeah yeah and they're like yeah. no 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 the the quantum effect is defined as the entanglement <laughs> uh you know like you you can see this in like an interference pattern it's like you know, we have a friend that basically says it's like the, the multiverse sort of talking to itself. Yeah. Right? And when that goes away, and it goes away as sort of like in all different ways, like, but especially when you have sort of a large system, um, it's easy to be quantum. So yeah. even if one little bit, there's a quantum thing happening, you scale past that, it's not quantum anymore. Yeah. Which is, which is maybe kind of the foundation of the whole universe, right? Maybe it's just like we're one big blanket of quantum whatever, and then matter and time and all the shit that is part of our universe is... The, you know what that's what's sort of built on top of that so like i think to me it feels like these guys have 
it's sort of like the panpsychist thing, right? Well, okay, maybe there's like quantum stuff happening in, and there certainly is, right, in every cell of our body all the time, but that doesn't explain to me like why humans do the dumb shit that we do. Like what, you know, like we had, like, we're trying to understand human behavior and what separates us from animals and higher animals from insects and whatever. And like, this seems like it's clearly not. Yeah. I, I felt like they were trying to drive a negative result to the audience to yeah. basically be like, <laughs> maybe don't have a quantum biology uh, session at a consciousness conference. I wonder if these guys were almost invited. Like, I wonder if after last year or something with like one of those like organizer guys was like, all right, we gotta we gotta cut this out. Like, let's 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 uh, and put these guys in their place. So, so Jim, I, I thought had a really interesting talk that got into the weeds, but then I think when he got to the punchline, it was really impactful. Yeah. I was telling you, like, you know, there's this issue with quantum tunneling when you try to shrink a transistor. At some point, like electrons just sort of like teleport, and, you know, particles teleport uh, over barriers, and that kind of ruins your circuits. And he seemed to indicate from experiments that basically this is also a problem when DNA splits. Yeah. And it seems that life has basically figured out mechanisms to get rid of the quantum tunneling well, effect. So, so his, his claim was that one in 10,000 like, gene splitting should cause a mutation. Yeah, and he's which like, is clearly like, that's yeah. not the case, and that would basically prevent life from forming. Yeah. Um, so there's a sort of defense mechanism to prevent that. Uh, which I think is super cool. Yeah. So if anything, quantum stuff is like being inhibited. Yeah, exactly. In order to, um, w which is kind of, you know, it's again, I think like the, I, I was reading this um, Thomas Kuhn book about like the, uh, it's called The Structure of Scientific Re Revolutions. I kind of started talking about it earlier. And he's talking about these sort of schools of thought and um, how people kind of change their mind over time. Um and, uh, boy, it's been a long travel day. <laughs> um, yeah, let's drop that one there. We'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah, what, what else is there to say? I, think, I feel like we covered most everything. Um, there was some quantum physics stuff in the middle of that session that I just, my eyes glazed over and... Um, I couldn't even tell you what was said. It yeah. was it was it was a lot. Which makes me wonder, are you know, is it the case that there are hardcore theoretical physicists in that audience? I mean that guy obviously was the presenter. Yeah. Or is yeah. it the case that, that guy like misjudged the, the audience in you know, in a classic oh, case interesting. of like presenter yeah. not really putting himself in our shoes. Yeah, is it mostly us and dudes asking like crackpot questions? <laughs> uh who are, yeah, I don't know. I like there's a whole track of I mean every single day I think there's sessions on quantum stuff. So, I don't think I will be going to any more of them. I, okay, one thing to wrap up. So, the in the first session the ethics AI consciousness, there was a statement made that you could have uh moral intelligence. Yeah. But you could also have moral agents that were not intelligent. And I'm have I'm having a hard time understanding what that means. Do you have Wait, was it not intelligent or not conscious? I thought it was not. I thought it was not conscious, which yeah, I, yeah, I would sort yeah. of okay, agree with, okay, right? So yeah. that's like this, that the robot thing where it's like programmed with, you know, responses and uh, which are moral based on how that's been programmed, but it's not actually intelligent. Yeah, I'll be excited to see if there's any more moral philosophy. Um, I kind of I feel like. That workshop really just started to scratch an itch, and I, I feel like there's this, it's such a big topic. I hope it like comes up again. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a. I, I was looking through the program. I think there's a. I think there's a couple more. So a uh, bunch of exciting stuff coming for the rest of the week. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, you can find us at concon dot show if you want to find uh, more information about us. Or you can find us in Termina for this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs>